views or opinions of the staff or management of radio station KKUPFM. Well, good evening once again. Uh, those of you who are in a position to do so, I would strongly recommend taping the program this evening. You're going to hear uh, as dramatic uh, a moment on or a, a time on radio as I have ever had. Uh, this was experienced last night on a KFJC-FM. Uh, there is, I am going to be playing as much as I have time for of an interview with Harry Martin, the editor of the Napa Sentinel, again recorded last night on KFJC. I had some technical problems, so the sound quality is uh, kind of poor in the first part of this interview, and uh, it was also uh, a very adrenal experience. So it's a little bumpy in places, some of it might be a little bit hard to follow, but uh, it is intelligible, and I would strongly recommend that people get ready to tape. But before we get into that, a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, coming up this Thursday evening from 8 p.m. to midnight right here on KKUP, Radio Free America program number 33, the fifth Radio Free America program in a seven-part Radio Free America series dealing with the Iran-Contra scandal. Specifically, the program number 33 recorded in October, actually uh, October of 1987, deals with suspicious deaths and break-ins performed in order to cover up the Iran-Contra scandal. That's this Thursday, 8 p.m. to midnight. And on Saturday evening at 7 p.m. in room F12 on the Foothill College campus, I'm going to be giving a lecture about the Aryan nations, specifically the evolution of domestic American fascism from the 1920s right on up to the present. I'm going to be talking about connecting links between uh, elements of uh, American fascist groups and the military and the government, uh, the roles uh, of elements of the Aryan nation in our political assassinations, and uh, it's going to be talking about a lot of things you don't generally hear about in connection with this subject. This lecture will be a fundraiser for KFJC-FM. For further information, call area code 415-949-7260 during business hours. 415-949-7260 during business hours. And the following Saturday, that will be May 2nd, I'm going to be lecturing in room 155 of Duenell Hall on the UC Berkeley campus. My subject will be connecting links between the assassination of President Kennedy and other American political assassinations and attempted assassinations of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. This will be a fundraiser for KALX-FM, the UCAL Berkeley station. For further information, call area code 510-642-1111 during business hours. 510-642 and 41s during business hours. And the address for the Napa Sentinel, if you would like to access their press packets, uh, and uh, that is to say Harry's press packets on his various investigative series dealing with the U.S. National Security Establishment, the Napa Sentinel is at 925 Lincoln Avenue. That is, of course, in Napa, California. The zip code is 94558. The phone number is area code 707-257-6272, 707-257-6272. And the address for archives on audio, which has all of the archive programs on permanent file. Also, uh, for those of you listening on the other side of the hill, Santa Cruz, Aptos, etc., the One Step Beyond shows that I do for four hours every Sunday night on KFJC are also available, though they are not on permanent file. I only get a chance to play an hour and a half of that information on KKUP, so those of you who are really serious about it might want to order the programs on a weekly basis because I get to play less than half of each program uh, here on KKUP. The address for Archives on Audio is Archives on Audio, Box 170023, Box 170023. That's in San Francisco, zip code 94117. 94117-0023. The phone number is area code 415-346-1840. 415-346-1840. I'll write or phone to the attention of Paul. Also, there is a 15-page catalog available, which has a synoptic account of each archive program, and it cross-references the programs with other broadcasts containing similar or related material. And once again, neither myself nor this station makes money out of this arrangement. This is set up FYI. We're now going to proceed to the interview that I recorded last night with Harry Martin, the very heroic editor of the Napa Sentinel. Those of you who were taping, please get ready to do so. We're going to go for about oh, 35, 40 minutes on the first side. Three, two, one, here we go.
with Harry Morton. We're now going to visit with Harry Morton of the Napa Sentinel, and uh, we're going to hear about his ongoing POW series, among other things. So, ah, uh, uh, that's the problem. Oh, okay, very good. We've got our uh, technical di another technical difficulty. Uh, solved here, folks. That's a much, much nicer sound quality. So we're now going to join Harry Martin live from Napa, California. Uh, good evening, Harry. Can you hear me? Okay, you're live on our airwaves. Uh, there are a number of things I wanted to speak with you about, uh, Harry, including your uh, ongoing POW series, as well as uh, the information that surfaced this past week about uh, Gunter Rusbacher and some things that uh, have not surfaced about him. Uh, and I also wanted to talk to you about the North American Investigative Journal that you had planned. Now, for the last several weeks, I have uh, read some of your PR. Actually, for about the last month, I have read articles from your POW series. For the benefit of listeners that might be new, there are substantive indications that, in fact, there are numerous U.S. prisoners of war still being held in Southeast Asia from the Vietnam War. Uh, the government is denying that for a variety of different reasons, including the fact that uh, some of those POWs might be able to shed light on the complicity of elements of our intelligence system in the Southeast Asian drug traffic. Uh, there have been a, I did an archive show about that uh, concerning a book called Kiss the Boys Goodbye by Monica Jensen Stevenson and William Stevenson. And Harry's been doing a very fine series uh, about this very issue. And in fact, uh, at this point, Harry, you are right up on the front lines, and I mean that uh, literally. Could you fill us in on some of the, de the developments that have not been read to this audience? Well, first of all, there is the second we, the, the audience would, would know that we had a first, there was a first mission going. Um, which was over there in February and then returned after having interviewed two A-6 pilots and the North Vietnamese government were going to allow them to, to leave the country, but without uh, exit visas, they didn't want to take a chance. The, um, the, the, the team argued back and forth. Uh, Harry, can you talk a little louder? We're having some problems uh, with your levels. The team uh, uh, argued back and forth over whether they should take these prisoners out without exit visas. So instead, they photographed and fingerprinted and came back to the United States. That team is now back in Hanoi. At least its leaders are in, still in Nevada, but the, um, the team itself is in Hanoi. Strangely enough, timing their their departure with the same with the Senate Select Committee on POWs, and I would suspect they want to link up with them, but I can't say for sure. In the meantime, we have another mission going, and this mission is basically um, somehow I got in the middle of coordinating it. Um, I didn't volunteer for the job, but the, the elements have been in place, and um, we are beginning to help uh, coordinate it. Now, this has been a very fascinating situation because we now see the exact inside of how the government works. We have been able to obtain, through our DIA contacts, several top-secret documents, um, which uh, a set of documents is dated the 10th of uh, April. The other second set of documents is dated the the 15th of April. Now, in the one document, now this comes from Guatemala 16. You have to understand the intelligence agency works out of Guatemala, and the first subject is, it is it's a very top secret classification, and it says uh, subject review of ELANT, which is electronic uh, intelligence, and DIA intelligence, uh, indigenous assets, uh, CITREP, uh, and basically what they're saying, they're, they're looking at the private sector intervention. Now, this is the first time the government has admitted to even knowledge of the private sector in intervention. Now, mind you, that first team that was going to go over to get the 10 and they were back in the country did testify before the Senate Select Committee. They have. Let me tell you, I'll read you the various aspects. I'm going to not read it the way they wrote it because, you know, it's all coded. I'm going to just try to bring out the full word. Okay, now, Harry, what, what exactly is Guatemala 16? Guatemala 16 is, is works out of the Guatemala Embassy and it's basically the, uh, a, a specific uh, watch uh, um, for the, um, the CIA and, and DIA. Okay. Okay, now the first item they mentioned is American Embassy officials and uh, special military groups reviewed intelligence and direct intelligence from uh, assets in Laos 
and, and confirm private sector receiving intelligence via uh, indigenous. The indigenous are the people there, network operating independently. Mm -hmm. Second, American Embassy unable to penetrate operational net. Now, this is us. Listen to this now. American Embassy unable to penetrate Operation that's suspected to be operating in Northern California. And this this is the operation that you were actually involved with? CIA um, Continental U.S. field operations confirm operation being directed by, and I'm going to leave the person's name out, obviously, uh, who is the former head of the Elephant Project, which we, I think you may have read one of those stories. We did. Well, for the benefit of people that might be new, Harry, why don't you review what the Elephant Project is? The Elephant is? Project was headed directly by Bill Casey. Um, Pat Robertson's uh, 700 Club was finally uh, actually doing the um, laundering of money. Uh, the entire operation was funded by heroin in Southeast Asia. It was to go in with six different teams to look at the uh, POW situation. They also operated a paramedical group in Calusa, California, um, a cover, and that was moved eventually to Montana. Um, and, and what it has here is that they have traced down that uh, the former Elephant Project leader is one of the individuals under surveillance and agency discretion. American Embassy received validation of visual of USN Lieutenant Larry James Stevens, MIA 21469. Now, Stevens is the one that, of the persons they had those photographs of recently, and, the, and, and they did, uh, a forensic scientist and the family said it was him. The U.S. government uh, debunked the whole situation, and here in their own dispatches, they are identifying him. Okay, now, Harry, uh, just by, by way of clarifying and reviewing, so Ele the Ele Operation Elephant, or the Elephant Project, was a U.S. intelligence operation uh, launched by Bill Casey and supported by, uh, among other things, Pat Robertson's 700 Club and the heroin trade, and that this, this operation was intended to locate POWs in Southeast Asia? Yeah, but not to release them, only to locate them. Aha. Uh -huh. And uh, now this... Uh, the Guatemala 16 group is an element of U.S. intelligence which is opposing the operation that you yourself are directly involved in, correct? correct. And, and as I say, it says, American Embassy unable to penetrate operational nets suspected to be operating in Northern California. Now, further, mm -hmm. embassy, American Embassy received confirming uh, private sector project may have established direct contact with USA. Air, uh, United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Charles Stoddard Rowley, another prisoner of war that is now showing up. Remember, there are no prisoners of war alive in Southeast Asia, according to the government. And here in their top secret memos, there are two names right now that have showed up. Now, let's and down what they're doing. Uh, Harry, how's that last guy's name spelled? Uh, uh, Charles Stoddard is S T O D D A R D. Last mm -hmm. name Rowley, Rowley uh, is R O W. L-E-Y. Okay, now, Harry, uh, if you could speak as loudly as possible, because we're having a little bit of problem with the yeah. phones here, and it, it's hard to get uh, our two levels. Okay, now, equal. okay, here's a very important thing. Now, we talk, talked about the interdiction, right? Right. Now, item number five, and this is on the, the, the tenth. Item number five, to preclude, an, to preclude anticipated missions, recommend interdiction of, this is the guy that is, is leading the team, uh, operational window concludes on 4-25-92. Confirm bank assets frozen. Now, what happened with this guy? His company wrote various checks. The bank assets are frozen. The checks bounce. And then the local district attorney in his county is instructed, and I'll show you the instructions, was instructed to prosecute him say, for a $1,925 bad check. Now, this, this is the leader of the, your team to locate POWs. That's correct. Now, when they... And of a $1,925 check, they asked for a $60,000 bond. And uh, this this basically in order to uh, get the leader of your team on ice. That's correct. Now, on Friday, he was subject to be prosecuted, and we bought the check five minutes before court. And so, in other words, that they would know that... They, they, so they would Right, and they could right. not prosecute. Mm -hmm. However, yesterday, we received an urgent call from inside the DIA, which said... Uh, uh, that we had to contact that man and get him out of his house because the DIA and the Defense Department and the FBI were en route to seize all documents in his possession. Okay, now Harry, uh, a lot of listeners may be wondering, particularly people who are newer to the program, uh, how in the world you yourself might be able to be involved in and, and actually 
operating a mission like this, uh, perhaps you would review some of your uh, connections going back to your work in defense publishing and some of the people that, uh, you know, without, of course, revealing any classified information, some of the people that uh, you have been able to, some of the, your contacts which have permitted you not only to access much of the inside information that you have concerning many of your national security investigations, but also uh, what permits you yourself to be actually involved in attempting to locate these POWs now. Okay, well, first of all, our, uh, we spent five years as publishing defense publications, various ones. We were one of the most quoted in the Pentagon, and we established very close ties with various military, from the Marine Intelligence, uh, uh, Naval Intelligence, Air Force Intelligence. Uh, Eugene Tai, who was the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, who was basically uh, um, blackballed after he, uh, I mean, he retired, but they, he's been criticized heavily after he began to sh uh, announce that these POWs were still alive in Southeast Asia. We also worked with the Mossad. Uh, we were the first and only journalist group allowed into Lebanon during the invasion. We were able to send a man from West Germany behind the Iron Curtain to work in the Soviet laser, laser laboratories to determine what the Soviets were doing in the Star Wars program. Cap Weinberger, who was the Secretary of Defense uh, at one time, called us up, uh, I think it was around 1984, and said that um, it was very critical that we uh, publish our articles on the MX uh, missile because the second